It's Sunday morning, and we're talking about the same subject for a long period of time. I found that you cannot teach the Bible in one lesson. Uh, it takes me about, oh, uh, it took me 18 months to do on Sunday morning to preach one series on the 70 weeks of Daniel, and I didn't finish it. I did uh, a, a series on Revelation in the early 2000s. I did four and a half years on Revelation. Very interesting stuff. I did four and a half years, and it, there were 236 messages, and I just had to stop because everybody's eyes were crossing by that time. And... And I had to stop, but I came back and did about another 35 or 40 messages on it. And I have been on it till I got this, uh, this problem with these blood clots, which I hadn't been able to come in on Sunday night. Uh, and I, it takes me a long time to teach. When you teach on Revelation, you got to know something about the Old Testament. There's just so much to know. And then uh, I've done series like this, and everything I do is in series. If I teach on demons, it takes me about two years on Sunday night, maybe two and a half years, just to teach on demons. Now, I've been teaching on uh, Christ's Mass, or we blended it with the sons of God marrying the daughters of men, sons of God. marrying daughters of men. Now, the Ku Klux Klan has taken verses in the Old Testament and they've tried to come up and show how that white is not supposed to marry black. That's not what any of these verses are talking about. Uh, anybody that stick a hood on their head and run around in the white sheets, you got to be an idiot, number, uh, number one. And... Uh, they teach, along with a bunch of Baptists, that black's not supposed to marry white. Well, I'll tell you what. If you're a believer, but you have to convince me you're a believer, and the person you want to marry is a different color, you come to me. If they're a believer, I'll marry you. It don't matter what color they are, what color you are. That has nothing to do with anything. Uh, and they use these verses, sons of God marrying daughters of men. And they use the verses that, in fact, Let's go over here to Deuteronomy 7. And I want you to notice real close what it's saying. It's not saying don't intermarry two different races. We're all the same race. We're all sinners. And I don't know what the difference is between a black flesh and a white flesh. I think they're all sinners. You can't come up and say I'm white and I'm superior. I'm black and black is beautiful and powerful. That has nothing to do with anything. God makes people whatever color he wants them to make, and he gives them the disposition he wants them to have. And if they are elect, he gives them all the same desire to seek Christ. Now, the Bible says, My brothers and my sisters are those who do the will of the Father. It has nothing to do with what color they are. Now, the clan will use the things that I've been teaching on mixing, they'll try to come up and say, you're not supposed to mix races. That's not even what this is talking about. In Deuteronomy 7, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it. Deuteronomy comes from duo and nomos. Duo means second. When you have a duet, you have two. And nomos means law, and it takes two witnesses to confirm anything in the Scripture. Deuteronomy is written just as Israel is about. They've wandered in the wilderness, wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and God tells them when they get to Kadesh Barnea, and they're murmuring against God, and they get here, down here in the desert, and God tells them to go in and conquer these Anakims. It's also the same thing. The land of Anak is the same thing as 
what the ancients called the land of the Philistines. It's on the it's on the southwest border of Israel, and that's the land of the Philistines. So today we call that the Gaza Strip. Gaza Strip. Now, now Israel was wandering in this when God told them to go into there in that 14th chapter of Numbers, they said they sent spies in there, and when they come back, they said, Moses, there's, those people are too big. They're tall. They're giant men. We can't whip them. And God had caused them to conquer when they left Egypt and came over here into this, into this uh, desert, and they crossed over this... Red Sea was somewhere right here. When they crossed the Red Sea, and it kind of trickles up and goes up here, when they crossed the Red Sea, he caused them to conquer the greatest army that had ever existed in the world, and that was Pharaoh and his armies. Well, when they come over here and they get up here, they go down here to Sinai, and the first place they go to, they go to Kadesh Barnea, just below, just below, the uh, just below Israel, and they're out here in this Sinai desert, and they go in there, send these, they send these uh, men in there that are 20 years old and upward, and that is draft age. That's what I call it in Israel. You couldn't serve in the army unless you were at least 20 years old. That's why David, David wasn't a skinny little. Uh, shepherd boy that stood there and went and God I hope you'll guide my stone David was very adept with the sling he said I can kill that man I can hit him right between the eyes and he won't get close to us those shepherds were so good with stones with a sling they could hit they could hit a hair's breadth at 50 yards he had been doing that all day long besides that David, he did that every day. He said, I killed, when he killed, when he's going to go out to uh, fight Goliath in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, David uh, said, I can't prove this armor of Saul's. I can't fight in this armor. I got a sling. I can, I can hit anything with this sling. And I've got a, and I've got a rod. The rod was a, they'd dig up a, a tree and round it off on the end, and they'd put hobnails in it. And David said, I killed a bear with this. So he wasn't some skinny little boy the day be that day he's going out to fight Goliath. If he's killed a bear with his, with his little club, and he's brought down all kinds of animals with those slings. So David, the reason David wasn't in Saul's army, he was just below the age to be in the army. That's the only reason he wasn't in it. Why, how could he go out there and do the things that he did? Because as soon as he got over there to uh, where Saul was, and all the women are singing, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands, and Saul is, he gets jealous immediately. And he puts David in charge of his bodyguard, hoping he'll go out and be killed. Puts him out there to fight. Well, see, he wasn't just some skinny little guy. The reason he wasn't in the army, he wasn't old enough, but he was very capable. Now, so what, Deuteronomy, they traveled, God said, just be, those people who murmured against God, these that are old enough to be in the army, I'm going to kill everybody from, from 20 years old and upward as of Kadesh Barnea, everybody except... Who was the two that Joshua and Caleb? These were the two that said, "We will go in and conquer these men. If God will give us power over this army of Pharaoh, He certainly can conquer these giants here." So, the whole point about Deuteronomy is just before they cross. Deuteronomy is just before they cross the border to come in and camp at a place called Gilgal. If you ever see Gilgal, God would have the 
armies, he'd have the armies meet at Gilgal. Gilgal was just across the border and right above the Dead Sea. And then in northern Israel was the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River ran down. The source of the Jordan River was the, was the Sea of Galilee and it emptied into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea was like the Salt Lake out in Utah. It, it had salt in it. You could lay down in it and not sink. And, uh, of course, fish couldn't live in it. So just before they cross the river, all of the unbelievers have been killed off by God. So when you're reading Deuteronomy, these are, this is written to the believers. Now let's read here. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land... They're going back to possess the land that was given to Abraham about 600 years before. And hath cast out many nations from before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you, Israel. And he's got some instructions for Israel not to mix with the people of the land. Not to marry them, but this doesn't have to do with their color. It'll tell you what it has to do with. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them from before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, even though they're bigger than you, just like Pharaoh was bigger than you. Pharaoh was at the beginning of, Pharaoh was at the beginning of the 40 years in the wilderness and these nations in the land are going to be are going to be stronger than them and they're going to be upon the entering of the land. So Deuteronomy is after God has killed off all the unbelievers in Israel. You got a lot of unbelievers in Numbers, in Exodus. But when you get to Deuteronomy, Israel's minds are cleansed. Thou shalt make no covenant with these people, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Why? Because they're black or white or red or yellow? No. Thy daughter shalt thou not give unto his son, nor his daughter thou shalt not take unto thy sons, for they will turn away thy son from following me they'll go after other gods that they shall serve other gods that's what it was about it wasn't about what color they were so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly and thus shall you deal with them you shall destroy their altars break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. You want to be special? You already are when you're elect. You don't have to accomplish something with money and fame or fortune. It's the fact that God chose you in him before the foundation of the world. A special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all people. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Oligos is the word few. Over there in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses seven and eight, few will find the narrow way. So, and huh? That's verses 13 and 14. Yeah, 13 and 14. What did I say? Seven and eight. Oh, oh. I'm thinking of the seventh chapter. All right, seven, 13, 14. That's right. Now, Look over here in... Read eight. Huh? Read eight? Okay. 
But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he has sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now go back to Numbers. And let's see Moses marrying an Ethiopian. The Ethiopian was a, was a descendant of Ham. Ham had a son. His name was Cush. The word Ethiopian means a Cushite. Look here in Numbers. Go over here to Numbers. The 12th chapter. To be a son of God, you had to, to inherit the Father's will. Sons of God were not fallen angels. Beloved, now are we the sons of God there in 1 John 3 and 1. We are the sons of God. The Lord told Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, let my son go. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. There in Romans 8 and 14, sons of God are those who walk after the commandment of God. You can't be a son of someone. And Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8, your father is the devil. That is whose son you are. But I know you're of the seed of Abraham. I know you're of the sperm of Abraham. But your father is the devil. Your sons of Satan. Now, this will give you an illustration here in verse 1. Miriam and Aaron. Now, Miriam was older than Aaron and Moses. This was their older sister. You remember, she's the one that pulled, that she saw the princess pull Moses out of the water. Moses means drawn out of the water. Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. Boy, I'll tell you what, that's, the word Ethiopian is Kushi, K-U-W-S-H-I-Y, K-U-W-S-H-I-Y. It means a Kushite, a descendant of Kush. The, the uh, descendant, look over here in the 10th chapter of Genesis real quick. 10th chapter of Genesis. I have to go everywhere in the Bible to verify something. The 10th chapter of Genesis, you've got to know when this is. This is called the Table of Nations. You can write that at the top there. Table of Nations. Table of Nations. And that's in Genesis 10. This is immediately after Noah comes out of the ark in chapter 9. In fact, chapter 9 is when God gives the, uh, the uh, covenant of God that we were talking about before church. He says in verse 10 of chapter 9, and Moses is Moses. Noah is coming out of the ark. I always get Moses in the ark. I don't know why. I want him. He wasn't an ark. He was in that little ark that the princess pulled out of the water. And God spake unto Noah and his sons with him. And I beheld, and I behold, I establish my covenant with you, with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, the eagle, of the cattle, the ox, Every beast of the earth, the king of the beasts is the lion, and with you. So anytime you see those four animals, you will know that that's talking about the covenant of the Lord that he established. Now go back to the 12th chapter of, of uh, Numbers. Now, they were angry. Miriam and Aaron, now where did they get their authority to be angry with Moses? They didn't have an authority. They don't like it because, well, I didn't finish reading that to you. <laughs> I got to go back to Genesis 10. I didn't, uh, Genesis 10. This is where 
the descendants. Genesis 10 is where it'll tell you after the flood where Shem went to. It'll tell you where uh, the sons of Noah went to, where Shem, Ham, and Japheth went to. The Bible will tell you in verse 24 of uh, chapter 9 that Ham was the youngest son of Noah. Noah woke from his wine, verse 24 of chapter 9, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. That was Ham. Now he had laughed at his father's nakedness when his father drank and got drunk. And we're not saying you're supposed to get drunk because Noah did. Uh, that was one of his sins. Now, then he tells you about Japheth, the eldest son. How do you know he was the eldest? In verse 21 of chapter 10, unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. So Japheth is the elder. And the people want to put Shem as the older, but he was the second born, Shem. Uh, Japh Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And always, that's the way God puts it in the scripture, but Shem was second born just like the other second borns were blessed just like Jacob's second born was blessed, just like Abel's second born was blessed. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the Shem was second born. Ham was, he was the youngest. He was the third born. Japheth is the eldest. He's the first born. Now, that's what the Bible says. And I don't know why people want to argue with that. And look here. He'll tell you where in chapter 10 and verse Verse 6, And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizrim, Phut, Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Sheba, Hevelah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Tabtika, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dan. And Cush begat Nimrod. So, Noah, no, no, Moses, married a Cushite. That word Ethiopian is Cush. So, in verse chapter 12 of Numbers, verse 1, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath, he, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Is God only speaking about Moses he married this black woman? What is wrong with him? And the Lord heard it. Ooh. God's blessing was upon the marriage of Moses. And now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. You want to know Moses' personality? There it is right there. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out, you three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he's going to ream them out. Now, you can say what you want to say, but this is what the Bible says. And he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. He's talking about Moses. And will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. Who is the faithful in all mine house? With him I will speak mouth to mouth. That last chapter of Deuteronomy said that Moses was the only one that God spoke to face to face. Somebody's blessed like that. I don't think I'm going to talk against them, are you? Be careful what you say about the preacher of God. God might deal with you for that. And I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, 
not in dark speeches. After the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. And wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses because of who he married? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Aaron and Miriam. And he departed, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and Miriam became leprous. She was the leader in this thing. It's a woman for you. Huh? That's a woman for you. It's a woman for you. <laughs> she was a leader in this rebellion and became white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not this sin upon us. Please forgive us, wherein we have done foolishly, wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed. Then he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, and God, I beseech thee, Boy, wouldn't you like to have Moses on your side? And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, that was an old ancient saying, to spit in the face. The, the use of saliva, remember uh, Jesus spat upon the ground and anointed the guy's eyes there in John the ninth chapter. Spitting was a ceremony introduced into baptism in the early church. The candidate was required to renounce the devil in word, but also by act and gesture. And also, spittle, although like all the other natural secretions, a ceremonial impurity was employed by our Lord as a curative means for blindness. And spittle was used in these rituals before they were nailed to the cross. Now, let's finish reading this. If the Lord had spit in her face, she should not be ashamed seven days. Let her be shut out of the camp seven days. After that, let her be received in again, all because she murmured against Moses for who he married. Watch out who you speak against. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Now, I want to show you a couple other of these verses, and people don't have any idea what they're talking about. They don't have any earthly idea when the Bible's talking about these people that you're not supposed to be intermarrying with. We gave this to you last week, but over in Ezra, the ninth chapter. Ezra, the ninth chapter. What God is saying, don't intermarry your life with unbelievers. He's not just saying don't go marry an unbelieving woman, unbelieving man. Don't marry with unbelievers. That's the whole idea of sons of God marrying daughters of men. Sons of God were descendants of God in Genesis, the fifth chapter. This is God's lineage. Genesis, the fifth chapter. And Genesis, marrying daughters of men. Daughters of men. The daughters of men were the sisters of the sons of men. In Genesis, the fourth chapter, are the descendants of Cain. Huh? Your marker is too dim. Yeah, I need to get my marker right. Daughters of the sons of men. They were the sisters of, of the sons of Cain. Sons of men was an old ancient term for Gentiles. So the daughters of men would be the sisters of the sons of men or Cain's. These were beautiful women, and the Bible says the Bible says that 
the sons of men looked upon these women that they were fair. There is a this goofy thing around that these are the, the sons of God are are uh, that they're uh, demons. They're not demons. They're not even angels. Angels cannot reproduce. They need to marry nor are given in marriage. That's that is a first time I heard that. I thought this is really wild. I don't know what people and I had to really start studying that. Sons of men everywhere you find in the Bible are sons of God. Our sons of God are believers. They're not unbelievers. And sons of men is an old ancient term for Gentiles. And uh, well, I was going to say something else, but I don't think I got time to. All right, look here in Ezra nine. Ezra nine. This has to do with us. We're not to be mixing our lives with unbelievers. The Bible says we're to come out and be separate and touch not the unclean thing in that sixth chapter of Second Corinthians. And if you don't touch the unclean thing, I'll receive you. You could not mix God's people with the devil's children. You've got that all through the New Testament. If I have time, I'll go through those. Now, look here at, at Ezra, the ninth chapter. Now, I believe this merits reading it again because sometimes people don't get it the first time around. All right. Ezra, the ninth chapter. Ezra and Nehemiah, their books there together, Ezra and Nehemiah were friends. They had to be living at the same time. We know they were friends because when you look at the 8th chapter of Nehemiah, well, I'll give you this just to show you this. 8th chapter of Nehemiah. You have Ezra and Nehemiah through Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Look here in... We know that... Uh, Now, in the book of Nehemiah, Ezra is spoken of as reading the word of God before the people. Ezra was a descendant of Aaron. He was a high priest. That's what he was. Now, Nehemiah couldn't have been a high priest. He was a cupbearer for Artaxerxes. And cupbearers... Most of them, most all of them were emasculated or castrated so they could not raise up any armies against the king or any kinfolks against the king. And that's what a cupbearer was, the closest man to the king. So Nehemiah couldn't have been a priest. Now when you go over here to the 8th chapter of Nehemiah, I want you to see that Ezra, when you get to Ezra, I'm not going to go into the 70 weeks of Daniel. <clears throat> Ezra had the third decree concerning the temple. Nehemiah had the fourth decree concerning this, and the fourth decree was concerning rebuilding the city, rebuilding the city of Jerusalem that had been destroyed way back here in 586 B.C. And it had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. We'll just put Neb there, and he was the Babylonian king that came in level the temple, level the city, burn it all to the ground, carried southern Judah over into captivity. Then you've got very you got these different kings that give these decrees. I'm not gonna go into it to a lot of detail. You've got Cyrus gives the first decree. He comes along in five 
539 B.C. The city was destroyed in 586 B.C. We're talking about 50 years earlier or so, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then Cyrus gives the first decree to rebuild the temple. And you'll find that in the 36th chapter of Second uh, Chronicles. And you'll also find it in the first chapter of Ezra. The 36th chapter of Second Chronicles, that happened. They were leveled to the ground in 586 by Nebuchadnezzar. And right at the end of the 36th chapter, it says Cyrus gave the decree right after Babylon falls. Cyrus gives the decree in 539 to rebuild the temple. And then that's the first decree. The second decree is given by Darius to reaffirm the first decree. You want to hear more about that? I've got a whole series on it. The third decree was given by Ezra to restore the temple. The second decree was given in Ezra. Ezra, the sixth chapter. And the third decree was given in Ezra, the seventh chapter. And that was in 4... 57, 56 B.C. Nehemiah, now notice when these were given. Nehemiah has the fourth decree, which was concerning rebuilding the city, and that was in 444 B.C. That was just 13 years after Ezra's decree, Ezra brings that from over here in Babylon, takes it over to, uh, takes this decree back to Israel, which is about 650 miles away. And when he gets there, he finds the people intermarrying and practicing this pagan worship. And he says, we were scattered because of this. You're not supposed to be intermarrying with these people. Not because they were a different color because they were idol worshipers. What does it have to do with us? It has everything to do with us. We're not supposed to be mixing with people that do not believe in the full, total Word of God. You, I can't run around. Is, does anybody here run around with free will people? I can't do that. I'd be correcting them all day long. Does anybody here run around with people that do Christmas? I can't do that. I'd say, why are you doing that? That's against God's law. If you, the more you're going to live right for the Lord, the more you have to draw a hard, straight line. And the more people are going to separate from you. Because we're to separate from the world. We're not to have any fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. Well, does darkness mean that they're or bank robbers? No. If they believe in free will, if they do Christmas, <clears throat> if they do all these things and they don't believe the things that we believe, what fellowship do you have with darkness and what concord does Christ have with Belial? What symphoneo, S-U-M-P-H-O-N-E-O. -E this is over there. This is over there in the sixth chapter, second Corinthians. What concord? Sum means to blend with. Phone means voice. How can your voice blend with somebody who don't believe the truth? How does your voice blend with them? It doesn't, does it? Do I go out in public and talk to everybody? Everybody I see, I talk to about the truth. If somebody says a cuss word, I'll say, where'd you get that from? You done a school lesson or what? I'm liable to say something like that. I'm liable to say anything. Uh, one guy would, used to come to me. I went back to the gym when I was 60. That was about 19 years ago. And he would come up to me and say, is this in the Bible? And he'd come up and said, is S in the Bible? I said, that's a real good word. Let me tell you about that. He was trying to 
get me. I said, he used the S word. I can't say it. I said, let me tell you what Paul said. Paul said, I have been, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, of the southern kingdom, no greater honor than that. I was circumcised the eighth day of Israel, just like Abraham was commanded to in the 17th chapter of Genesis. And I said, he said, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. My father's a Hebrew. I'm a Pharisee. All of these things, this is what the Jews would applaud. But he said, I count all these things but dumb. That's the word you're looking for. Scubalon. And I said, it's the word S-K-U-B-A-L-O-N. I said, there's the S word you're talking about. And he went, he's standing there going, just staring at me. And I said, if you get another one of those words, bring it back to me. We'll talk about it, okay? And he just looked at me real, real peculiar. Oh, okay, Jim. And he walked away. He was being a smart of it. Going to catch me and embarrass me with a cuss word. That's a good word. Bring me back another one of those words. And we'll define it according to the Bible, okay? And every time he'd walk by me after that, he'd say, Hi, Jim. I'd say, Hi, Eric. How you doing? Didn't have to jump his case. I've had people say, Well, hell. I say, I recognize that word. Wait a minute. I think that's over in the 16th chapter of Luke. The rich man died, and then hell he lift up his eyes being in torment. That's where a man goes when he don't repent of his sin. That's a good word. Just just define the word for them. They're, but don't get mad at them. Don't say, don't cuss around me. That's a good way to say cuss around me because that's what they'll do. But they don't like definition. I promise you that. I've, <laughs> I've had that said to me so many times. Somebody will say, well, what about that? And I'll say, well, I'll, let me talk to you about it. I don't care what word it is. There's not a word that men use that's not found in the Bible, even the F word. So I'll say, that's a good word. Let me tell you about that. Do you know, people don't want you to define words for them. Now look over, I just want to show you, Nehemiah and Ezra were buddies and pals. They're only 13 years apart in bringing their various, bringing their, and they both come over here in Babylon so they knew each other in Babylon, and they knew each other over here. Here in chapter 8, verse 1, all the people gathered themselves together as one man in the street. This is Nehemiah 8 and 1. That was before the water gate. thought that was only in politics, didn't you? And they spake in Ezra, unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And Ezra the priest... This is in the book of Nehemiah. Ezra, the high priest of God, brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from morning until midday before the men and the women. And these could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law when Ezra read to them. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they, pulpit, there it is. <laughs> uh, they had made for the purpose beside him and stood Mattathiah and Shema and, An and An 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 Anania and Eurija and Hilkiah and Messiah on the right on the on his right hand and on the left hand Padia and Mishael and Malkiah and Hashum and Hashbadana and Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people. Ezra does something I do here. Watch what he does. Above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, 
the great God, all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their heads, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab and Shebathai, and Hodijah and Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Pelea, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. He caused them to understand. So they read in the book of the law distinctly. Boy, I like that. Parash. P A R A S H. We would get our word parse from that. When you parse a word, you tell it means to specify, to separate, or to parse words. This is the subject. This is the predicate. Here's the, there's the uh, predicate nominative. If, the, if it's straight up and down, it's the, uh, it's the direct object. You got your, you got your uh, modifying words here. That's what they did. They defined the words and told people what they meant. They read in the book of the law distinctly and gave sense. Sekel, S-E-K-E-L, understanding. Gave the ability to understand what the Bible was saying. And if anybody knew what that was, that was this high priest of God, Ezra. They gave distinct understanding and caused them to understand the reading of the word. That's what I'm trying to do here. Now, Ezra. Back to Ezra. When Ezra gets over there, he comes before, he comes in 457 B.C. He's coming from Babylon. He's coming from Babylon over to Israel, 650 miles. And this is in 457. You got to remember, Israel was destroyed. Southern Judah was destroyed in 586 B.C. So if you, if you go up to 4, uh, if you go up to 457, 140 years earlier, that's when Ezra was destroyed. Well, here you've got Ezra is coming back from over here in Babylon, 650 miles away. And guess what he finds when he gets there? Israel intermarrying with all of these pagans. God is not saying don't intermarry races. That's nothing to do with this. This has to do with what he said in Deuteronomy 7. You'll go after their gods. You say, I won't go after somebody's God if I run around a free will person. Yes, you will. First of all, you'll cut them some slack and say, ah, this is not the time to correct them now. All the time is the time to correct somebody that calls himself a Christian is living wrong. And you don't have to be mean. You don't have to be abrasive. Most of y'all have been around to me when I witness to people. I don't beat anybody up. I just say, well, let me tell you something about the Bible. Let me tell you something about Christmas. When Christmas comes, I say, Christmas is Christ's Mass. It's Roman Catholicism. Did you know that? Do you know what the Mass is? The Mass is eating human flesh. The Mass is eating of the so-called body of Christ, Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And I tell him that. But I said, Jesus said, my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. I say, eat flesh and drink blood means to eat of indeed. Indeed is the word alethase. It means of truth. And that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you truth. And if you don't like this, you're going to cause me to eat flesh and drink blood or partake in a slaughter. You're going to spiritually slaughter me if you don't like this. So many people want their families to believe 
you can't have your families to believe just because you want them to believe. You have to accept the fact. I've said this before. Look over here in. Let's just look at it where the Bible says it. Look at Matthew 10. We'll give you two places where this is talked about. People are not going to get angry with you because you talk about accepting Christ and I go to church and I walk down the aisle and I get baptized. They're going to say, that's nice. But if you say Christmas is pagan where our whole society celebrates Christmas, they're going to get mad at you. They're going to say, you've joined a cult. Even though America hasn't celebrated Christmas for about 120 years and that's it. And it was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. Tell people that. Say it was against the law. Now over here in the 10th chapter of Matthew, the Lord is giving the apostles a commission to go out and to preach in the world. In verse 32, Whosoever shall, therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Confess, homologeo. Homologeo means to be of the same logos word or to agree with. And the Bible says, just because you say that with your mouth, it don't mean you're confessing. Some men profess that they know God, homologeo, but in works they deny him. It's what you do as to whether you're whether you're confessing Christ. Are you separating from the world? You know how long it took me to learn to do that? I was over 50 before I really got a hold of that. I was probably close to 60 before I really started saying, I've got to do this. Now, then he says, Whosoever shall deny me before men, deny or nail my means to contradict. You contradict God by what you do. Remember Titus 1.16. Just confessing that you know God is not enough. It's what you do. In works, they deny Him. They contradict God. If you contradict God, 1 John 2, 22 says, He that denieth Christ is antichrist. Deny or nail my means to contradict. You contradict Christ by what you do. You can say it with your mouth, but if you don't do it, you're the Antichrist. It's not just enough to say it. God's got to be alive in your body every day. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Now, I had a guy call me and said, Jesus was a peaceful man. He loved everybody. He did not. He turned the tables upside down over there in John. In the sanctuary, he said, you made my father's house a den of thieves. You're a bunch of crooks. Why did he say that? They were selling lambs in the temple. They were coming to the various sacrifices. Well, everybody didn't have lambs. Everybody wasn't a shepherd. There were, there were fishermen that would come there, and they couldn't bring fish. That wasn't part of the sacrifice of God. So they had to buy lamb when they got there. The Pharisees come up. They said, we're going to require that you exchange your Greek money, which was the standard of the day in the marketplace. We, we're, going to, you're going to, we're going to require that you buy the sacrifices that we sell the lambs in the temple with Hebrew money, which is our money. So what they were doing was charging exorbitant interest rates for switching the money over. That's why Jesus said, you made my father's house a den of thieves, not because they were selling lambs there. They had to sell the lambs because that's the only way some of the people had to offer a lamb sacrifice. They had to buy one from the Pharisees. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And the sword is going to be quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's going to be the Word of God. For I am come to set a man at variance to alienate him, 
against his father and a daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be those of his own household. That is a requirement by God. It's going to happen. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. You can't turn against your mother. If you cannot tell your mother the truth or your father the truth, you're not worthy of God. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life here in this life will lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake, the same shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. If you tell people the truth, if they don't want it, they're not receiving Christ. Let me read down to the end of this because this is something people don't understand. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Verse 42 confuses so many people, but let's read it. Whosoever shall give a drink into one of these little ones a cup of cold water. All the water that they had there was in cisterns that were filled with flies and and the fortunate thing was that you could get cold water out of a deep well and they called that running water they called it living water. Cold water means living water and the Bible calls the blood of Christ living water or calls the calls the Holy Spirit there in John the fourth chapter when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well he said I'll give you water and you'll never thirst again and she says how can you give me living water the well is very deep and it's Jacob's well and the water is flowing down there and it's cold down there and you don't have anything to draw with he said I'm not talking about that kind of living water I'm talking about the Holy Spirit this is talking about witnessing that's right the cup of cold water is the living water and your family will hate you for it all of these words here they're part of the previous words these don't no word stands alone in the scripture only in the name of a disciple verily i send you he shall in no wise lose his reward that's the living water that's also called in hebrews 10 pure water Remember that? Over in Hebrews 10, I don't know what got me off the subject, but I'm going over here. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. How much time do I have, Mike? 36. Huh? 36. I meant to get back to all these verses about not fellowshipping with people. All right. Hebrews 10. If you find a word that has the same meaning as another word, nobody had cold water in Israel. No one. You had to get that from a well where the water was flowing. It was an arid land. It was a hot land. To say cold water, that there meant you have dipped down into Jacob's well or to a deep well, and you're pulling up that cold water, living water. They call the blood living water. Jesus called the Holy Spirit living water. And right here he's saying the same thing in Hebrews 10 and 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. We're elected unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood there in, in uh, uh, 1 Peter 1 and 2 and having our bodies washed with pure or living water, which would be the Holy Spirit. They had different ways of saying the same thing. Now, go back over here to how is your family going to hate you when you separate from them? It's caused me a lot of grief in my life. 
you're appointed to grief. Are we predestined to conform to the likeness of Christ or the image of Christ? Image, icon means likeness. Icon. If we are to be like Jesus, what was he like? Well, he had a lot of things, his qualities, his character. He was angry at lying false teachers. He said there in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, <clears throat> when you see these men coming with winds of doctrine that make the church apathetic and make some past feeling, be angry at these people. That's a command. Or gizomai, it's an imperative mood. It's an imperative command. Or G-I-Z-O-M-A-I. -I. You're commanded to be angry at them. If you do not have an anger at preachers for lying the way they're doing in America means you don't know anything about the Bible and you need to get to studying and learn. When I'm angry, I'm not angry at people. I'm not angry at anybody here. I'm not angry at anybody that's seeking truth. I am absolutely furious with Billy Graham and Charles Stanley. They don't tell the truth. They preach, accept Christ. That's not true. They preach a sinner's prayer for salvation. That is absolutely not true. And they preach Christ's Mass, that Roman Catholic doctrine called Christmas, and that is paganism. Am I supposed to be angry at them? Yes. Gosh, I need to go over there. It's one of my favorite. Well, hold your place here in Luke 12. Luke 12. You've got to separate from the world. The Bible says... Romans sixteen seventeen to mark them mark scopeo it's our word scope you put a scope on your rifle and you aim at someone you point at. You point out people, mark them which cause divisions. Gosh, I want to go there. Well, where was I going? I got so many places to go. Luke 12. Let me go ahead and go to Luke 12. Then I'll go to. Let me go ahead and go to Luke 12. Your family has to be angry at you. Just the way it is. Does it make me happy that my 57-year-old daughter wants nothing to do with me and I haven't seen her since she's 25? Did that bother me? You know how many tears I cried over her when she was little? A million. I don't have any for her anymore. She hates what I preach. She lives somewhere out in California. She don't like me. She don't like what I'm teaching. Did it break my heart for a long time? Did it break my heart because my mother and father didn't want what I preached? Riding down the street with my mother in a car, the gentlest woman I've ever known in my life. Never met any woman as gentle as my mother. I said, Mama, let me explain to you predestination. She said, Jimmy, now I won't have that in the car with me. Don't you talk about that. I'll make you get out of the car. Exactly what she said. Did that hurt? Yeah. Especially because I was the skinny kid in the middle, like my sister said, that my father never paid attention to, and he was the domineering factor in the family. And Clyde was the oldest son, so he had his favorite. Janice was the only daughter, so that was his baby girl. And Dean was the rotten, spoiled brat that was the youngest. And... Janice said, Daddy never paid any attention to you. And I'm the only one that ended up studying the Bible, knowing something about it. Does that bother me? They died without me around. Does that bother me? Well, yeah. But they're supposed to not want the message I preach. 
I used to sit down with my mother after high school, in high school, sit down in the kitchen for 45 minutes to an hour and just talk to my mother one-on-one. -on -one. Real gentle, gentle lady, but she just didn't want the truth. Oh, I did a lot of tears over that. Look here in, in Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 49. I am come to send fire on earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? He's not talking about a literal fire. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. The word strange, X-E-N-O-S, or X-E-N-I-A, Kazenia, comes from X-E-N-O-S, which is the word stranger, an occasional guest. Don't think that the fire is an occasional guest. Jesus has come and already kindled it. It's a fire between you and your kinfolks and your friends. It's going to happen. I have a baptism to be baptized with. He'd already been washed in water. This is the fire he's talking about. How am I straightened? Soon echo. Held together until this fire be accomplished in my life. Suppose that I am come to give peace on earth. Boy, this sure does disagree with people. Jesus was nice to everybody. He was not. Have you ever read the 23rd chapter of Matthew? <laughs> he called the Pharisees children of hell. They were a bunch of Baptist preachers. That's what they looked like. They were the most religious men of the day. He called them snakes. And they walked around quoting the Bible all the time. Called them generation of vipers. He called them liars. He said, you compass sin and land to make one proselyte. And after he's made you, make him twofold more of the child of hell than yourselves. Does that sound like a nice Jesus? Suppose you that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house. Divided against three, three against two, two against three. Don't expect your family to want predestination and Christmas is pagan. Mine didn't. I have people call me and say, how can I get my mother to believe? I can't even get my own mother to believe before she died. How can I help you with yours? Unless I can become the Holy Spirit. We used to have a guy that come here and say, well, tell somebody, can you turn yourself into a mailbox? It would be easier to turn yourself into a mailbox than the Holy Spirit. So just turn, try turning yourself into a mailbox, and then maybe you're on your way to becoming the Holy Spirit. You say, that's ridiculous. I know it's ridiculous. No one can convert anybody. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straight while you shall, you say, there cometh a shower, and so it is. And when you shall see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky. Why is it you will not discern the signs of the times? People don't care what the Bible says. They say, I want what I want. Look at Romans 16. I love this. When I first heard this read years ago, I was very young. I said, I love that chapter. I love those verses. Romans 16. Sons of God, man, and daughters of men has to do with our day and time. What do you mean our day and time? Well, the Bible says in the 24th chapter of Matthew, as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Ek, G A M I Z O. Ek, Gamedzo is the word given marriage 
It means to give away a daughter. We're not supposed to be giving our daughters to the world. He says, don't give your daughters to their sons to marry them so they can take them out of your household so they can go out here and raise kids to worship his God. We're not supposed to be doing that. Romans 16. You know how many verses there are in the New Testament about not intermarrying our lives with people? It's not talking about, certainly you're not supposed to marry an unbeliever. But you're not to let them drag you away into the lies of the preachers. Look here in Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, scopeo, take aim at, regard them, point them out to people. I think what we're about to say is important. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions, dicostasia, D-I-C-H-O-S-T-A-S-I-A. D-I-C-H-O. S-T-A-S-I-A. Deco means two. Comes from die, meaning two. Two. Stasia. Two standings. Two different doctrines. There's not two different doctrines for Christmas. There's not two different doctrines for predestination. You believe predestination the way you want. No. They're vessels of wrath that are fitted to destruction, Romans 9.22. They're fitted, catortizo, fully accomplished. Fully accomplished to be destroyed. Same thing in, in 2 Peter 2. In 12, these as natural brute beasts are made to be taken and destroyed. Made. G-E-N-E-A. Born. From Ganea, we get the word Genesis, which is the word Genesis, which is the word nativity. They were born to go to hell. That's what they were born for. These are the same ones that are that are there in Romans 9:22. God willing to show his wrath and make his power known, he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. That's the ones that are born to be taken and destroyed. Proverbs 16 and 4, the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. That's what they're made for. That's the majority of the world might include your mother and father. I don't see how my daughter can go to heaven. I don't see how. She don't believe nothing. She was running with a bunch of charismatics the last I heard. That's as big a lie as is going on in the world. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Scandal on. Scandalon was a little trap stick. It was a little sapling bent over, and it had a had a little trap to it. When the little rabbit come along, it'd pop, maybe break its leg, and you and you caused it to stumble. Those that would cause God's people to stumble with Christ's mass, stay away from it. Jim, that's easy for you. Well, you know why it's easy for me. There's a real reason. I've learned enough of this book that I've got a thousand answers for every question they ask. I don't even have to get breathing real fast and going, ah, 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 gosh, I got an answer here. I got a, I've got answers. I just, and I don't really care if they believe or not. You know why? If they believe and they obey God, God's given the hearing ear and the seeing eye. It has nothing to do with me. I can say what I want to people. 
I'm not the one that converts them. I'm nothing more than a water hose. There's the word of God comes out of my mouth. And I just simply say, Lord, that's up to you if they belong to you or not. You know, that's one of the reasons a lot of people have a hard time witnessing. They get to breathe. You ever breathe real hard when you start to witness? Did you ever do that, Judy? You don't have to because they'll hear, they'll hear one sentence if they're elect. You can quote Genesis 1-1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And if they're believers, they'll hear that. If they're not, they'll make an excuse. Well, you're going back to an Old Testament, some obscure words. I had a guy tell me that time, one time, you're going to obscure words of the Old Testament. I didn't know anything that was obscure in the Old Testament. And offenses that'll trip people up that are contrary to the doctrines that ye have learned. Contrary, para, parallel. The worst doctrines are the parallel doctrines. That's Pentecostals, that's Charismatics, that's Church of God. Church of Christ, they got a Jesus, they got a saved, they got a salvation. They all got a baptism, don't they? And it's all different with them. And they got all of this, and it don't mean what we're saying. They got the other Jesus, they got the other salvation, they got the wrong baptism. They got water, and we've got the living water. Then he says, what do you do with these people? Avoid them. <laughs> Mercy me. Avoid. Eklino. E-K-K-L-E-I-N-O. Or L-I-N-O. Eklino. It means to lean away from them. It means to get away from them and deviate, decline from them. That's imperative. Get away from these people. Do you get away from them in a mean way. I can't talk to you. I don't want to. No. You can be gentle to them. Best way to get away from them is talk to them about some Greek words and Christmas being pagan, and they will leave you alone. They're not going to be around somebody. Oh, oh, we had a Christmas party. Well, I don't celebrate Christmas anymore. I found out that it was Roman Catholicism. Did you know that Christmas is Christ Mass? Why don't you just break the word down and tell them that? See, it's Catholic. Are you a Catholic? I've had people say, Merry Christmas. I say, are you a Roman Catholic? Well, no. Well, Christmas is Roman Catholicism. I've done that to people. Now, what happens if you rub elbows with these people? Do I have any time, Mike? All right. Let's go over here to the book of Haggai. Here's what happens when you rub elbows with the wrong people. Haggai is at the very end of the Old Testament, not the last book, but Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Haggai. Haggai and Zechariah came along when they were rebuilding the temple back over in Ezra, I believe it's the fifth chapter. This is where they first come along. I think it's chapter 5. Yeah. Chapter 5 of Ezra. Then the prophets Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that when Judah and Jerusalem, in the name of the of the God of Israel, even unto them. They're telling them to get back busy building the temple. The first decree was given to rebuild the temple by Cyrus when he overthrew Babylon. Cyrus was the, was the Persian king. And that was given in 538 B.C. They built for two years they caught so much flack in 536 B.C. 
they quit building. And a man named Tatnai, we're not going to go into Tatnai right now, but he's the guy that put the word out and said, we're going to tell the king over here in Babylon you if you don't stop that building. I don't know who you think you are. Well, Tatnai got his comeuppance before it's over with. And Zechariah and Haggai began to prophesy around 520 B.C. Haggai prophesied for three months and Zechariah prophesied for two years. And they were telling Israel, get back to building the temple. And it was like they come to a standstill. Well, in Haggai, Haggai, this is about separating from the world. And Haggai, oh, I'm over here in the back. I'll have to get over there. Haggai is a little short book, but it's powerful. In the second chapter, in the 10th verse, the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius. Now, I know that Darius started ruling in 522. 522 B.C. So I know that this is in 520 B.C. because this is in the second year of Darius. Came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Now, here's Haggai's words. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, this is Haggai prophesying, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, Ask the priests, If one bears holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, the way the priest would carry those sacrifices to offer them, if this is the temple, if this is the temple, And here's the altar. And they have, they'd have to be, go over here and wash at the brazen sea. And they'd have to go over here and take a lamb, let's say. And they're going to take it over here. They would carry it in the skirt of their garment. And it had to be holy <laughs> and have no blemishes in it. And it cannot come in contact with anything that's not to be a sacrifice. This is one of the best illustrations of what happens to you and I when we rub elbows with the world. If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil, something that's not going to be sacrificed, or any meat, shall it make the meat holy? No. And the priest answered and said, No, just the sacrifices to be offered. What is the sacrifice in our case? Our bodies are a living sacrifice. We're not to come in contact with something that's not sacrificed. Then said Haggai, If one is unclean by a dead body, touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, Yes, it shall be unclean. If you come in contact with something, what are the dead bodies? People out here that are the walking dead out here, the unregenerated people, then answered Haggai and said, so is this people Israel. The reason we're over here the reason we're giving commandments to go back and rebuild the temple is because you rubbed the elbows. Ahab brought Jezebel, the priest of northern Israel, uh, the king of northern Israel, Ahab, marries Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, and she brings Baal in the grove into Israel, the sun god and the tree goddess. Is that corrupted Israel? Yes. You run around with the wrong people. You corrupt. Jim, I don't know how to live that way. Well, you're going to have to start working on it. 
I didn't know how to live that way. I used to attack people when I was a young preacher, and that wasn't the way to do it. Learn enough of the Scripture that you won't have to attack him. You'll say, the Bible says this. And if they don't want it, say, well, if you don't want it, that's okay. You're not, but don't come up and say, well, I preached to them. They didn't want it, so I ran around with them anyway. I went ahead and kept bowling with them. I kept playing golf with them. <laughs> You're supposed to pull away from them. I know that's hard. Jim, that's too hard for me. You have to work a job, don't you? How do you do this? Boy, that is the trick to learn to do. The main thing, Jesus told the Sadducees, you do err not knowing the Scripture. That's where your answer is. Learn this book. Watch the DVDs. Write the words down. When you get out in public, you know two Greek words, use them. And if you don't have the answer for them, say, I'll get back with you later on that. I don't know that. But it don't make them right because you don't know the answer. Haggai said, So is this people Israel, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean, because we were scattered over here because they were cavorting with Ahab. Ahab brings in Jezebel and right up in this area up here is Syria and they serve Rimmon and right down here on this side of Israel is Ammon. This is what he's talking about is the land of Ammon and the land of Ammon worships Molech or Moloch. And down here in southern Jordan is what we call Jordan. Uh, that's Moab. And they worship Shemash. And Shemash is the Greek word, Hebrew word for sun, Shemash. And down here is Israel. Down here is Egypt. And you've You've worshipped all of these gods and sun gods and come in contact with them. When you rub against dirt, you get dirty, don't you? You don't. Mary doesn't say, honey, I'm fixing to wash clothes. Get all the clean clothes out and throw them on the floor. We're going to put the dirty clothes on top of them. And the dirty clothes, if they'll sit there so long, they'll make the, the, the clean clothes will make the dirty clothes clean. Is that what the way you wash clothes? I wish it was that easy. <laughs> <laughs> pile all the clean clothes in the floor and put the dirty clothes on top of them. It don't work. What this is talking about is being holy. Holy. It's talking about godly. It's talking about righteous. Holy hagios means means to be pure. What makes you pure is the fire, isn't it? Think of not strange, strange concerning this fiery trial which is to try you. It's difficult. It's hard. There's a verse I love over there in First Peter, the fourth chapter. This is what it's talking about when it says, if the righteous scarcely be saved. Scarcely is the word mogus. It means with great difficulty. Where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? It's hard to learn to stand in truth. You can't stand in truth. You can't stand in the truth of being a plumber if you don't know plumbing, can you? You can't stand in the truth of the Word of God if you don't know Scripture. There's so many verses in the New Testament concerning this. And it's going to make your family mad. Just accept that. But the more truth you know, the more confidence in God you're going to have. You have to learn to use the Word of God publicly. Do you, I'm going to say this one more time, and then I'll say it again the next time. <laughs> this is the hardest message I preach. This is harder than preaching Christmas. 
This is harder than preaching predestination. Telling people we're predestined to be like Christ. And what was he like? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Well, that means you're supposed to be sorrowful and acquainted with grief, doesn't it? What's going to do that is your family is going to turn on you. Your friends are going to turn on you. But you're not going to go out of your way to make them angry. You're just going to live in truth around them. And you're going to get the reputation. You're going to say, but Jim, I don't want, I don't want everybody being angry at me. Well, nobody wants that. But you can't be real good friends with the people that come to grace and truth if you're running around with that. Can you? He calls it lukewarm. Yeah, that's lukewarm. He says, if you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. I won't drink that kind of elixir, God says. Am I out of time, Mike? All right. Verse 15, And now I pray you, consider from this day upward, from before a stone was laid upon the stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days were when one came to an heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. He says earlier in this book, you remember one of the judgments of God was the famine? And Haggai says, Verse 6, you have so much, and you bring in little. I'm bringing a famine upon you because you won't be obedient to me. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you have not filled with the drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes in it. I always think of my bucket's got a hole in it. Oh, Hank Williams so, And that's what this is about. It's about you can't fill things up because I told you I was going to bring famine on you and I was going to destroy Israel. And Haggai is living at a time where the temple is leveled and they t they're telling people to get back busy building the temple. He's preaching to them in 520 B.C. and they finished the temple in 516. I'm just... About out of time. I got so many more of these verses on not fellowshipping with these people. What happened to Israel here, Haggai says, will happen in our lives when we rub elbows with dirt. But the people of this world hate the dirty daily cross because they they love dirt. You know what the Bible says? The people of the world love dirt. Everything's made of dirt. They, that's why they hate the cross. They hate the cross of Christ. Their God is their belly. And their mind is on earthly things. Their mind is on dirt. How are you going to run around with somebody that all they think about is dirt? All they think about is their cars or their... I drive an 18-year-old car. Runs good. Why do I want to buy a new one? I could. I am not interested in a newer car. So people will say, boy, Jim, uh, uh, I hate what you preach, but I love your car. No, they ain't going to like your car. New cars are for showing off. That's what they're for. I know that. I've done that. Has anybody done that besides me to buy a new car when you didn't need it? You could have put the money in the bank. But you drove a car off the curb of the car lot and you lost 5000 when it went bump. The first bump, you lose $5,000. I'm out of time. We're going to come back. I haven't finished this. There's so much to this. This is about everything in the Bible, about separating from the world and learning righteousness. Righteousness comes from the word right. Do what's right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, help us. I know the church needs help when it comes to separating from the world. I, I, I know how hard it was for me when I was young and trying to learn. 
and some of these folks are older than me when they were when I was starting I had a lot of time to learn and some of them don't have that much time give them strength teach us to stand in truth we'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name amen Tomorrow's the 15th, but I ain't going to be here till the 18th. I've got some money for you at the house. Okay. In fact, I've got more than the 300. I'm giving you all a, a, a Want us to come over bonus. This? Come I'm giving on. you a bonus okay. this month. Because I ain't going to be here till the 18th. Well, I'll have it, and I ain't going to run away with it. Okay. Whatever you want to do. Okay, maybe I'll come over a little later after we eat. I'm not. Sure you use I'm it. not gonna. I'm not gonna run away with your money. It's gonna oh, be know. there. I'll die before I let anybody have it. Kind of low right now. Yeah. And I could use it. You know, this week. Okay. Well, whenever you want to come by. Okay. I meant to bring it today, and I forgot. Uh, I'll probably see you. Um, I'll just come by after we go to eat. Okay. What you doing there, pretty girl? I have a quick question for you. You started off with Cosmo and Tassimo. Everything in the Tassimos is in the Cosmo? Huh? Is this everything in the Tassimos is in the Cosmo? And not everything in the Cosmo well, is in the Tassimo? Is that correct? Tassel means an orderly arrangement. Right. Cosmos means a masculine orderly arrangement. Or it can, it depends on which word it is, whether it's masculine, feminine, or neuter. Uh, These were the ones that you were talking about. The word world is the word cosmos. It actually says cosmos. So or you want some gum? She wants some gum. I can <laughs> some gum. Just a second. Well, I was just simply saying they were different words, but they had the basic same meaning, right. unless they were masculine. One is included in the other. Like, well, because like maybe I shouldn't have said that, because that depends on the part of the ego. Uh, I'll sit down with you and talk about that. Uh, I could probably rewatch it too. Okay. There's so much in all the Bible. They all connect, this morning connected with everything yeah. from one end to the other. You want some gum? You're going to have to take the gun I give you because I don't have all the other kinds. How you doing? I'm doing Here you go. That's all I got for right now. Brother Dave. Hey, Scott. What's going on, man? Not much. Hey. Jim, let me ask you a question. I can see how right comes from righteousness, and you talk about your rights. But well, how does the right hand, why is that called right? And why well, the right hand was the hand of authority all through the scripture. The son would sit at the right hand and, uh, and hey, Jim, what are you doing there? What a message for the needy. What a message. <laughs> Very I wonder convicted. If I hope so. I hope so. How do we do this? I don't know. I don't know how people can miss all this. I, I don't see how they, well, they don't know nothing about the Greek words. That's one reason. They just read those verses and just skip over them. They read them and hop, skip, and jump out of them. 
Oh, okay, I love you, man. I love you too. What are you doing? Hey, what are you doing, Andrew? I'm doing good, Jim. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Join it. What are you doing, neighbor? And I do mean take, neighbor. Taking the, taking the word in. Just try and take it in and ingest it. And it's hard. It is hard. The word contrary again in Romans 16. Para. Para. Just think of parallel. E A R A. Parallel comes out of that. Yeah. P A R A L L E L would be, it means near. P A R A. Yeah. Comfort is the word parakaleo. It means to call near. Para is a very yeah. common prefix in the language. Para means near. So the word comfort, para, kaleo. Kaleo means to call. Ek kaleo. Ekklesia is the word church. Kaleo. Out. Call out. You gotta, if you learn what those prefixes are, when you see one, you'll say, oh, that means near. Comfort, consolation is para, kalesis. The word comforter is para, parakletos, P-A-R-A-K-L-E-T-O-S. That's the word comforter. So, comforter, consolation. I mean, stick with para right now. <laughs> you're, you're me a so, para, think of parallel, near. P-A-R-A. Just think of parallel, near. That was, that was a challenging, a challenging message. <laughs> well, it's, it's difficult, I know. Nobody knows it better than me. But the way I can talk to these doctors, they don't know nothing about the Bible. Yeah. And I'll give them a dozen Greek words when I'm sitting talking to them, and they, they'll be going, kind of staring at me going, in awe. And the more we use these words, the easier it becomes, and it, it just literally mystifies a lot of people. Yeah. It astounds them. And they go. Well, I see where I'm at. Right? I don't want to have to stumble and try to think. And I want to know that I know. You know. Well, you got to learn them. You really know. You got to learn them by reading them. As you say, when you really know, then you have confidence. How you doing? How you doing? You're doing pretty good. How you doing? I'm making it. Are you? <laughs> making it. Making it. Are you? Jennifer, right? Yes. yes. Jennifer. Hi. This is Jennifer. Hi, Ben. Hi, nice this is Ben. I know Tony. He does. He has, he's not here, but I know um, Sherry. And they're kind of 